ones that do come, they love it, but you know, yeah. it's convincing people that Lincoln is okay, you know, yeah. go ahead and come. So <laughs> we have indoor plumbing and stuff. It's yep. fine. <laughs> and more than just corn. Right. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah so hopefully some really good things come out of this all of this a crazy situation so. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah gotta roll with it and adjust that you do I, I think the biggest i hear a lot of times you know there's a lot of questions around like how do you deal with kids at home and you're on zoom calls and i think really the big thing is I think everyone's done a pretty good job of learning to roll with a kid running into the room and interrupting something. I mean, you just learn that that's, that's life at home. So, and everyone, you know, they're good with it. Dog yeah. barking here and there. Yeah. And like that, so yeah. yeah. That's what the mute button's for. Right. <laughs> I love the progressive commercials where they're all on Zoom and it just... <laughs> Which is pretty funny. I don't know if you've yeah. seen those, Dana, but they, they have the Zoom call and one person's, you know, there's a dog barking, another person's texting really loud. And it's just, it's yeah. kind of, it's, it's all the bad things that can happen in a Zoom call all happening at the same time. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, it looks like we have a few people starting to join us. Jeff and Laura, welcome. Monica, welcome. Is the glare behind me too much or are we okay with that? I think it's fine. Gives you kind of like a nice little, a nice little glow. Yeah, like a little glow. Like a <laughs> usually we don't get much light in that window, as much light, but <laughs> so we just have a couple more minutes and we'll get started. We'll start right at 10 o'clock. See somebody from the city of Auburn joined us. My sister and family used to live in Auburn. So welcome. Thank you. Who is your sister? Linda York worked at the hospital. That's been several years now. I don't recognize the last name. Yeah, it's, it's been a long time. Okay, well, it looks like it is 10 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. So real quick, just a good shout out. So good morning to everyone today. I hope everybody's Friday is off to a great start. This is Dana with Southeast Community College, and I just want to give everyone a big thank you for joining us this morning for getting a grip on leading projects. Uh, before we begin, I do want to let everyone know that you have joined us with the ability to manage your audio and video. So it is your choice. If uh, you want to uh, join us with your video, feel free. If not, that's totally fine. But you do have control over both of those. Um, you're welcome to contribute to the conversation throughout the webinar. However, 
We do ask that you remain on mute while in listening mode. We will also have a Q&A session following the presentation where you are welcome to ask questions or you can still submit your questions in the Zoom Q&A feature. And we will answer as many of those as we um, can during the time that we have allowed for us today. With that being said, I would like to introduce Steve Slate. Steve has more than 30 years of project experience and has taught for more than five years at the university level. Work experience includes several years at the Hewlett Packard Company, as well as work with various nonprofits. He now owns Witterations LLC that helps clients not just think outside of the box, but to literally out with the box. Steve is a certified project management professional and holds bachelor's and master's degrees from, from Colorado Christian University. And with that, I'm gonna turn everything over to you, Steve. All right, thank you, Dana. It's great to be with all of you this morning and uh, looks like we have a, a good group joining us. We're going to be a little interactive this morning. So um, if you have questions, feel free to pop in and ask. Um, feel free to pop up the video if you want to, to let everybody see your face. Um, don't have to, that's certainly optional. But there will also be some, some work we'll do. As a matter of fact, I'm going to drop the URL in the chat box really quickly here. I meant to do that just a little bit ago. I'll do it now. And it's, uh, if you were with us the last time, it's a little interactive uh, whiteboard application that you can use. So um, let me see if I can pull up my chat. There we go. So at some point we'll, we'll be uh, rolling over that URL to do some work. So um, with that said, we'll go ahead and get started. So um, Dana, Dana introduced me, appreciate that Dana. Um, if you want to use the chat or raise your hand, feel free to do so. Um, if you hover over that little box that you see with the mute and all that, all that good stuff in there, um, you're probably pretty familiar with Zoom by now or, or different, different applications, having been working from home for, for some time, so um, for many of us. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Um, we're going to do something completely different this morning than, than I've done before. We're going to uh, go on a little expedition. I was doing a little research for this class this morning and I, I had not heard that there is actually a dwarf planet called Far Out. And that's short for Far Out There. <laughs> that's actually uh, the name of a dwarf planet. So we're going to plan an expedition to that planet. Um, and way back two years ago in 2048, there was a group that landed on Far Out that, that we're going to actually take that a step further, actually several steps further, and we're going to go trek across the planet that's about 250 miles radius. So we're gonna, we're gonna go and that's going to be our mission, that's gonna be our expedition for 2050. Our objective is to be the first team to trek across the most distant dwarf planet from the Earth that's within our galaxy, and that's the planet, the dwarf planet Far Out. So for our journey, we're going to need to select a project team. We're going to make a short stop at the space station on Pluto. We're going to, which is another dwarf planet that some years is a planet, some years isn't. That kind of goes back and forth. Um, we're going to follow through to the, to the dwarf planet far out. We're going to land and trek across, across that planet. Um, we're going to enjoy a well-equipped SpaceX Dragon Model XYZ that has three escape craft just in case. And of course, part of our expedition is to get back home safely. So those are, those are the tasks that we have. And you're going to help us get there. You're going to help with selecting the team. Um, I hope you are anyway. Help with selecting the team and help with some of the, the things that we're going to do this morning. And we'll, we'll jump, and that's the URL I gave you. And we'll jump over to that in just a second. So here are some of the assumptions that we have with our team selection piece for this trek. We assume that it's going to be a very dangerous project, a uh, very dangerous mission. There's a chance you will not come home. Um, we're going to assume that your leader does not have stellar project track record. Um, that makes it a little harder, doesn't it? Um, some of the requirements here are you're going to need a team of about 27 people for this trek, for this journey. 
Um, don't worry, we've got plenty of space in model XYZ, it's, it's got plenty of room. And we're going to need everything from janitors to doctors to astronauts to cooks, people that are from every walk of life for every kind of task that you can imagine. Um, we're going, because it's a long trek, it, it's going to take us a while to get there. There's going to be a lot of work to be done, keeping things clean, keeping people happy, um, fed, the whole, the whole ball of wax. So how do we go about recruiting? How are we going to make the recruiting happen? Um, I don't know about you, if somebody came and told me that there's a trip that's, that's far, far away, that you may not ever come back. There are days that I would jump on it and say, yeah, take me, let's go. There are other days I would say, nah, I, think I, I think I'm think i happy here. So we've got to come up with a recruiting strategy. We've got to come up with some ideas to recruit our project team. I assume that all of you are here this morning because you work on projects. I assume that you've had some experience recruiting um, a team, maybe hiring people, uh, or maybe you're just handed a team and said, here's your team, go do it. But let's put on the hat of recruiters here for a few minutes and figure out how we're gonna get the team that's gonna join us on this, on this journey to this guy. So we're going to go over to, to, the, um, to the sheet here in just a minute. It's, it's a uh, program called Miro. It's a virtual whiteboard and we're gonna go over there. There are sticky notes on Miro um, when you first get there. So what I want you to do is you just get there, claim a, claim a sticky by basically hovering over it uh, with your cursor. And then when you're ready to come up with ideas for recruiting, how are we gonna get this done? You'll simply double click on your sticky and begin typing your ideas. And then we'll look at the ideas that you have. So be sure to think of it in terms of a project team that you're recruiting for. It just happens to be a really big, dangerous project that we're doing. So let's scoot over there. Some of you are already on the board. Good, good, good. So claim one of those stickies on the left underneath the um, team selection, and most of you are there. And double click, and if you need to get a new sticky, there should be, um, maybe I'll have to drag some over. It looks like there's a lot of you flying around. Let me, let me pull some other stickies over. Just grab one and start typing away. Don't take them too far away. <laughs> Go ahead and leave them in that in that general area if you don't mind. Looks like some of you might be on cohesion. Um, there's just a little bit of text for team selection. All right. I see a lot of things moving. I don't see a lot of typing. I don't see a lot of ideas yet. So go ahead and just double click. You should be able to double click and type and type away. I'm gonna grab this one. I'm taking somebody sticky from under cohesion and moving it under under the team selection. Looks like it went back, <laughs> that's all right. All right. Everybody kind of getting an idea of what we're doing here. Do you have any questions? You, you can open up your mic if you have a question about how this works, if you're having trouble with it. Okay. So just to clarify real quick, sorry, nope, are nope. we going for like the, the type of jobs or how we're going to get to those people? No, you're, you're, you're how you're going to recruit your people, not necessarily the type of job, but how do you convince somebody to come join us? Okay, perfect. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. I can't seem to get a, get a sticky note. Um, let's see, try hovering over one and then double clicking it. Okay. 
I would I would say, you know, this, well, you probably don't see your name. Um, the system assigns names. I'm having the same problem. I can't seem to get the sticky note. And when I double click, it just seems to change my screen view. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, shoot. OK. I'm not sure. It looks like some some people are, are don't don't think that it's you. It, it could be something with with a lot of people being involved or it could be that um, somebody else has your sticky. So we'll we'll. Uh, one of those one of those, I think, guest builder, I see a guest builder up oh, there you go. Somebody's got that going. So we need to in sign in, Tamir. I'm sorry. We need to sign in. You don't have to know. It's it's a guest. It's set up for guests. Okay. So well, let's go ahead and. I'm it sorry. seems to block like some of the information is like down into the screen, so it's like you can't see everything. You can move your screen around. So if you click outside, um, you can click outside of changes to hand and you can, I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, but it'll, it'll actually uh, move it around. Let me get rid of that. Steve, for those that are unable to use the sticky note, uh -huh. uh, <clears throat> would you just want to have, maybe have them put their ideas in the chat? That's fine, yeah, that's fine. That's a good, good call. So let's go ahead and read what some of you have written and we'll take a look at it. Share the adventure, explore the unknown, the excitement, challenge. Oops, oh, they're typing as, as we're writing. Here's, I'm reading it here. Okay, communication marketing plan. What else do we have here? Someone who knows how to grow potatoes, the physical, okay, this is the actual jobs that we need. Communication, marketing, types of individuals needed. Let them know it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. You need to be a motivator. I think I saw some showed up over here. Far out needs you. Far out will need all kinds of explorers, farmers, teachers, surveyors, but most of all, we need you. Good. A leader with a better project management track record. Okay. That always does help, doesn't it? All right. So good. Those are some of the ideas that we have. So those are some of the ways, and we're gonna we're gonna take a look at about this back at this a little bit later. So um, let's go back to the the presentation now. And some of the challenges. So in Expedition 2050, some of the challenges. Space Station Pluto warns you of an impeding. So we've made it. We're jumping ahead a little bit. We've made it to uh, to Pluto. It warns you of impeding meteor storms between you and far out, but you decide to proceed anyway. Sure enough, it's bad, and you're forced to land on the dwarf planet Eris, which is a mere 24 AU from far out. One AU um, in space terms is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, so it's 24 distances between the Earth and the Sun. So you can see far out, you can see the light from the planet, you just can't get to it. So we're going to go back to the board and look at meteor storm and you're going to be there for possibly months. So you've got your team recruited. Um, you've done a good job with that. You've got your team. You're on Pluto. How do you keep your team together and motivated? So we're going to go back to the cohesion. If you can see the cohesion frame and um, there's a couple things of, on marketing in the cohesion frame. We won't worry about those. But let's try again on this sticky thing, see if you can get a hold of them. Did we have some things come in on chat, Dana? I don't have my chat up right now. Too many screens. I'm not so far, no, nothing okay. through that. So, so for, for the cohesion piece of this, now what we're asking is based on what you've learned, based on what you know, your experience with projects, how can you help provide cohesion? So how can you help provide cohesion? And what are some things that you can do to help keep your team motivated? All right. I'm seeing some things come in. 
to see if I can pull up chat, see if anybody has anything in there. Not so far. Okay. All right, good. Okay, good. Make a clear plan for survival. Assign daily tasks. We are all in this together. We're learning and growing. Do team building exercises. Good. Command structure and a plan. Bring a psychologist along to address. That's good. That's good. What else do we have? Clean and concise plan. Single point communication. Set goals to accomplish throughout the project and keep motivation and drive. Okay, this is great stuff because this is this is stuff that we're going to come back and look at soon. So good. All right, rolling back over to the presentation here. So there are more challenges on our expedition. Your main ship is down. It's hit broadside by a swarm of meteorites. So the prediction was true. The meteorite storms were bad. You do have three escape crafts that you can get back with. The storm rages and you decide to head back and abandon the mission, head back with the, with the, the escape craft. Now there's some dissent on the team about how you're gonna do it. One of the members threatens revolt. Now, we didn't really focus too much on this, but are there things that you would bring along on the trip or that you would allow your people to bring that might be of comfort to them, might be something that would help with the morale, might be something that would be that would keep them interested. If that's the case, what might that be? What might that look like? And what would you allow them to keep? Because if you're moving from spaceship XYZ down to the little escape crafts, people are gonna have to not only abandon the big ship that's now been destroyed, but they're gonna have to abandon some of their belongings as well. So let's move over to the meteor storm. You're gonna abandon, but you're right now you're stuck for months because you think you might be able to make it. So what are some more things you can do to keep your team together here in the, in the meteor storm block? What are some things that you would let, let people keep if they brought them? Remember, you're, if you have to completely abandon, which we will eventually, what are they going to have to um, get rid of? Or what are they allowed to keep and not have to get rid of? Personal item. Religious symbol, good. Things that remind them of their family, good. Play, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> All right. Keep personal items, good. Something that is easily held. All right. Good deal. I may be missing some and I apologize, but um, I think we're getting a pretty good, pretty good idea here. Anything else? Within weight restrictions, good. One personal item, things okay. All right, let's roll back to the presentation. So now that the spaceship has been destroyed, everything is looking bad, um, your mission has evolved. You were planning to go to far out and trek across it. And now your milestone task is to get back home safe and sound. Now, does I wonder if this sounds familiar to anybody, the little project that we've just kind of worked through. Does that sound like something that maybe you've heard from historical information? Um, does the name Shackleton ring a bell for anyone? Has anybody heard of Sir Ernest Shackleton? So basically this, this exercise that we've just gone through, what we've just looked at, some of the things we've just done is based on a real project, a real event in history from Sir Ernest Shackleton. It wasn't 2050, it was an expedition in 1915. And his goal was to go trek across the South Pole. Amundsen had already made it to the South Pole. That had been Shackleton's first goal. Amundsen had beat him there. But a little about Shackleton, he was a master mariner. He was an explorer, although he had lost the race to the, to the South Pole. 
He was a journalist, he was a politician, and he lost his race to par parliament. So here's a guy that, that had several things that he wanted to do, several things that he wanted to accomplish. He was actually sent back from one trip as kind of a loser. He didn't have a great track record. He did have charisma, and he was able to convince people to join him on his trek. So in 1914, he finalized plans to take a ship to the South Pole to be the first to physically trek across it, not the first to land, but at least the first to be across the Antarctica via the South Pole. He was able to round up an amazing crew, and while they weren't stranded on a planet, it probably felt like that. They were stranded in the ice in a storm. Really, hope should have been lost. Here were 28 people. Their ship is just literally destroyed. They did have the escape crafts, the escape boats, but their ship itself had been destroyed. The crew, they made it home after two years of desolation. They actually made it home alive. I'm going to pull up a short video here. I hope that everybody can hear and see it. And this is just a little excerpt from, from a movie about Shackleton and, and the adventure. If you can't hear it, let's not worry about it. Look at the pictures. The pictures are actual footage that were taken by his photographer that was on the trip. It, it really truly is actual, actual footage and actual pictures um, that, that will pop up in just a second. So here we go. From the bottom of the earth, the it's real footage here. All right, did that come through for everybody? Yes, okay, good deal, thank you. All right, so I hope that kind of whets your appetite. Real quick in chat, if you have seen or are familiar with, um, with this expedition with, with uh, Ernest uh, Shackleton, could you just type a quick yes in the chat and just say, yes, I, I'm familiar with the story? Or no, if you're not. Okay, several of you are, good deal. All right, looks like you all are. So we're gonna be doing a recap, that's all right. There's, there's some really good stuff to learn about leading projects and getting a, a grip on, on project management or getting a grip on project leadership. So David Foster Wallace once wrote of Shackleton, real leaders get us to do better, harder things things we can't get ourselves to do on our own. I hope somebody in this group, I hope, well, really, I hope all of you at some point has had somebody that has lovingly pushed you to be better than you could be by yourself. Um, I, I can think of people in my past that, that have done that. And I think as we talk about project leadership, our goal isn't to push people in and just to make life extremely difficult for them. Our goal is, though, to push them a little bit harder to get them to do things that they didn't think they could accomplish in a, in a careful, guiding way. We, we can't overdo it. There's a balance there. But, but there's certainly the truth of, of how can we 
how can we push harder? How can we make things happen in a way that, that we're a part of it? We're not just forcing people to do it. We're, we're a part of the, the, the instance, the, the, um, the project. So a little bit more, he was able to, to round up an amazing crew. And while they weren't stranded on the planet, it felt like that, we'd already, we'd already talked about this, um, made it home. So let's, let's talk a little bit about what, it can, what we did this morning in comparison to what Shackleton did um, on, on this journey. So again, the assumptions that we talked about were it was a very dangerous project. There was a chance the crew wouldn't come home and Shackleton as a leader did not have a stellar project track leadership record, uh, project, project record. So how did he go about recruiting? So there are rumors that this may or may not be an actual ad that he had placed. Men wanted for hazardous journey, small wages, bitter cold, long months of complete darkness, constant danger, safe return doubtful, but honor and recognition in case of success. So see Erna Shackleton at Fort Burlington Street. So I don't know about you, I'm not too sure that I would um, immediately rush and go, hey, that's something I wanna be a part of. But yet there's something about it that says that, that kind of does rile within many of the, the journey. Um, let's prove that we can do this. Let's get this done. Let's make this happen. So whether this is an actual statement or not that he put in, um, there's reference both ways that it is, there's reference that it isn't. But anyway, um, we don't know that he really used those exact words. But people knew what they were getting into. The bottom line is people knew what they were getting into. They knew they may never come home. He was honest with them. He, uh, he talked to them and let them know what was, what was up and uh, didn't, didn't lie about what was going on and, and the danger of the trip. So we look at the cohesion factor. So it's been said that there were two dining rooms one that was for the leadership of the, you know, like Shackleton, maybe his crew leaders. And there was another larger room that was for the rest of the crew. And it's been said that one of the first things he did was he came in and he removed those barriers and made one big room. Um, I think back to my Gila Packeter days, um, that um, man, um, the CEO at the time, completely lost his last name, Lou. Um, Back at, back at HP, I was at a trip to, uh, to California, to the headquarters, Palo Alto. And there, there was a lunch going on, a, a lunch event, and the dining room had been closed for all the, all the people, so there was a cookout. So I was in line there at the cookout, and I looked behind me, about 20 people, and there was the CEO of the company in the line talking to the people. Mind you, this is a, you know, over 100,000 people in this company. And yet the CEO took the time to come out to meet with the people and he stood in line. He didn't go to his executive dining room. He, he was with the people. He was getting to know his people. And um, a lot that I learned about leading came from the Hewlett Packard way of leading. Um, the term management by walking around came, was kind of coined by Hewlett Packard. I wish we had time to, to watch a video this morning, but it's, was, it's just about the length of our our event, so um, we won't do that. But it's about having the Hewlett Packard way of leadership. And that's what, what, uh, what Shackleton did. He, he took down the walls, the barriers in the dining room, made one large room. It didn't matter who you were or what you did, you were treated equally by Shackleton. Now I'm gonna, I don't have this written down here, but I'm gonna segue real quick. There are some people that think Shackleton was a terrible leader because he led his group into some danger, even though he was warned, probably shouldn't do it, the ice is gonna be too thick. So there's that side of the story too, but hopefully we can focus on the positive side of, of how he treated his, his people and took care of them. He wanted them to succeed. He did everything he could and maybe that got him into a little bit of trouble. But Shackleton did spend time with every crew member. He got to know them all very, very well. He did everything he could to keep morale up. Morale up. Um, they did plays, they did music. I want to skip back over to the cohesion piece here. 
on our board. And let's see. Make a clear plan for survival, assign daily tasks. He was good at assigning daily tasks. He made it clear that they were all together in it. And while he didn't have a psychologist that he brought, he kind of served as one because he understood the mental situation that people were dealing with. He did do team building exercises. I don't know that they called him that at the time, um, but they did a lot of exercises together. He did have a plan. Uh, single point of um, communication, that was him. Set goals to accomplish throughout the project to keep motivated. He absolutely did that as well. Um, the banjo was an important part of it. They would sing together. They would work hard, they would play hard. Uh, January 15, of 19, January of 1915, the endurance became lodged in ice. They could see the bay that they were going to. They could see it from where they were at, but they couldn't reach it. November of 1915, the endurance succumbed to the ice and the ship was completely destroyed. And that little video showed the ship actually destroying that was captured on, on the camera that the photographer had. So between those dates, everybody had jobs to do. High level crews scrubbed the floor alongside the rest of the crew. Everyone had games. Everyone had games to go play and downtime they played together. That little video showed him playing some soccer outside on the ice. Everyone even had haircuts. Um, they made sure to do that as Shackleton had observed in the past that crews and morale go down as people let themselves go. Now I'm not, <laughs> I'm not advocating that you have to have a haircut in order to be um, happy and to, to have high morale, but it was the factor of taking care of yourself. Um, at that time, the, the haircut was a part of that. And so he made sure that his, his crew was taking care of themselves in whatever way they could to help keep the morale up. Everyone had songs to sing and they sang together, they played together. Everyone worked hard to break the ships. And again, on that little video, you can see them with pickaxes trying to pick away, with saws trying to cut the ice away so they could free the ship to no avail. It, they just couldn't do it. They would cut out the ice and it would fill right back in. Eventually, again, the ship broke due to the force of the ice and the waves. Now, when they were abandoning ship, they were forced to get rid of everything. And we asked that question as well, but the very essentials they were allowed to keep. And here's, here's a, a key to the whole leadership thing that, that impresses me. Shackleton had a very expensive cigarette case that had been given to him, I believe it was gold, had been given to him as a gift. And in front of everything, he tossed it. This was something that was near and dear to him that he really loved. And he made it clear that he was no better than the rest of his crew. He had no more rights than the rest of the crew. And he got rid of other stuff as well, but that was one of the things that, that, that he symbolically got rid of in front of his crew and said, we've got to pare down. We've got to take on the minimals, the, the minimum essentials. But at the same time, he made sure his photographer had the pictures and the camera, and he made sure that his musician had the banjo. He realized how important the pictures were for history and how important the banjo was for morale. Leonard Hussey was the owner of the banjo and he'd play it often and they'd sing along with, with Leonard. Um, they, they had quite a, quite a number of songs that they would sing together. But Leonard had, had written down in his um, memoirs, Sir Ernest saved the banjo just before the ship sank, saying that we must have that banjo if we lose all our food, it's vital mental medicine. So as you're working in a project and as you're paring down things, as you're, as you're looking at the bare minimums, what are the banjos that you need to keep? What are the banjos that you need to save for your project? Um, I'm, I'm gonna open up the, or ask you if, if anybody here I just noticed a comment about the haircut is still important today. Absolutely. So um, I'd like to ask if anybody wants to just open your mic and say if in a project there was something that, that you did or that you've seen done that helped morale in the project. Is there anybody that, can, that would, would be willing to share a, a real life experience about morale in a project that somebody did? 
Yeah, I could share on that. Um, this is Crystal Gregerson. Thank you, Crystal. Go ahead. Yeah, we have a project that we do every year, which is we do vacation Bible school within our church. Uh -huh. And so it's distributed to the North American division, which Great. is Canada, uh, Bermuda, Bahamas, and the United States. So okay. what there, we, we hit roadblocks all the time. And so what I've found out with my team, it's the same team every year, but I've found out that when we hit a roadblock, the best thing is to, for us, is to we either go out to eat together, nice. where, we, where we vent and <laughs> discuss, <laughs> and then we can move forward. Or I, what I've done as project managers, I've just gotten them gift cards, and I've made them go off campus and go to either the mill or, you know, just a coffee shop or something where they get away from the situation. And they come back with better attitudes. Nice. Now, how has that worked during? Has your organization stayed at home during? Yes, and that that's been the difficult part. My whole team is home, working from home. So we do Zoom meetings weekly, uh -huh. where we just chat what's going on with our lives, what's you know what everybody's doing, mm -hmm. and so that has helped. And we keep that's the only way we keep in communication, you know, we instant message or we do zoom, yeah. but I have not seen my team in 13 weeks. Wow. That's, that's hard. I was going to say gonna... your, your treat could be to come back together and actually meet <laughs> in the office. <laughs> right? Well, we're hoping to someday. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. All right. How has, the, how has the pandemic impacted your project? Like, will you even have vacation Bible school this year? And what has that done for the morale? What we've decided as, as a, our, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> our, the person who's a, um, who pays for it, <laughs> basically our client, he, she has asked that we do a virtual vacation Bible school now. So we've had to switch um, our, the way we work this, we had to make everything online. We had to, every, we had an actual training seminar last night where we had over a thousand people signed up for a training webinar on how to do virtual VBS. So we've had to shift gears on that, but we did it. <laughs> That's a lot of people have. The word pivot come to mind? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been a lot of pivoting lately, a lot of pivoting. Well, good. Anybody else? That's that's great. I I remember a meeting that people were kind of bummed out about, and it was kind of rough. And I brought Oreos and cookies, Oreos and milk, and it just kind of it, you know it's just a nice thing. So um, anybody else have something where where you had a banjo, something that that saved the day, brought up morale. That's thank you, Crystal. That was great. Anyone else? With there offsite is to go. Is this Terry? No, this was me just letting you know that there was something in the chat, but you got it. Go ahead and read it, Dana. Oh, so we did have a response from Terry. Um, they mentioned on one project team, they went offsite to ax, to go ax throwing. The key was the social time while relaxing and having fun away from the work environment. Well, that sounds cool. As long as you weren't throwing the ax at the project manager, it sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> that that does that actually sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's things like that. It's things like that. Those are the banjos that can help with morale. And your team might have a actually might have a symbol that you bring in at the beginning of your project, and that's something. And maybe it's an axe. And at the end of the project, if we succeed on this project, we're going to go celebrate and go axe throw. So, uh, you know, just there's there's crazy ideas like that that you can come up with as you're leading projects to uh, to help with the morale, give people something to look forward to, something to be excited about. So um, on the morale side, when they were abandoning the ship, they had a limited number of nicer, warmer sleeping bags available. Shackleton made sure his crew had the best bags and he took and the leadership took what was left. They were kind of threadbare and not, not as good. Quite honestly, they, they hadn't prepared maybe as well as they could have for such a disaster. And um, he ended up giving everybody else the, the best and he took what was left. He led by example. He loved his crew and his crew loved him for it. And for the most part, they would do anything that he asked of them because 
they knew his heart. They knew that he was there with them. So there's so much more to this story. And I hope you guys have a chance to, to look it up. Um, there are some great YouTube videos on, on this. Um, but, but in short, this is, this is what Shackleton saw, what the crew saw when, when Shackleton would speak. He, he literally told him, ships and stores have gone, so now we're going to go home. And he was very matter of fact and to the point. But on the inside, I pray God I can manage to get the whole party to civilization. So on his outside, transparency is good. That's a, that's a good thing. But yet he still portrayed, we're going to do this. We're going to get this done. While secretly on the inside in his diary, he was scribbling down, I pray that we can get this done, that we can make it happen. So ultimately, after literally insurmountable odds, literally, it was like flying blind in a storm. It wasn't like flying blind. It was blind. It was sailing blind in a storm to find a very small island. They were able to hit that island. And, um, and ultimately, he brought his crew back home and alive, all 28 people. So it's, it's, a, it's an excellent story to, to, to look at if you have a chance. Um, is there is there anything anybody would like to add that, that is familiar with this story? Anybody would like to add anything to the story about Shackleton and how he kept the morale up, how he um, helped the team? Even though his, you know, speaking of pivoting, he did a huge pivot when he uh, his mission became to get people home instead of to go see the um, to to go trek across the South Pole. Okay, Not, nothing to add right now. Let's, let's look at it this way. What, what can we learn from Shackleton today? Be honest in recruiting and throughout the project. Get to know your team. Anybody else, either through chat or um, open up your microphone, unmute, and tell us anything else that we can pull from Shackleton that would help us with leading our projects today? Anyone at all. Validating your team, showing that you care. Thank you, Jeff. Vet out the team first. Yep, Jennifer. The emphasis on equality between all levels of the team. I think that's huge, Terry. He went out of his way and when the tough jobs came up that nobody wanted to do, everybody, including himself, did them. All right, anything else? All right, let's move on. We're gonna, okay, one more, be adjustable. Be ready to pivot, Crystal, yep, <laughs> be ready to pivot. All right, so let's, let's look at the communication side of things. I'm gonna pop up a quote here that I, if I have a quote that's my favorite of all times, it's this one by George Bernard Shaw. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it's actually taken place. Now, I don't know about you guys. I, my wife reminds me often that I will try to communicate something that makes absolutely no sense to anybody else. And we need to, uh, I, I think it makes sense. And to me, it's, it's you know, quite logical. But to other people, it might not be. So what we have to look at in the whole communication sphere is that communication actually has taken place, that we've actually said something that, that makes sense, that's logical. There are some things that we can talk about to, to help with that. But um, so I think everybody has a, a, a chat function. Um, we see that thing running. What I would like to do real quick as a, as a quick little exercise, have one or two of you chat privately to me. You should be able to chat to the panelists well, I guess we're all panelists. Let me see. Okay, you should be able to select me and do a private message to me. And what I would like you to do is tell me your favorite hobby. Don't tell anybody else. Just type to me your hobby. All right, David, I see what, what you've written. And it, it's a great hobby, isn't it? I, I can imagine that you really enjoy it. And, um, I imagine that, that every day you probably look forward to doing that. And as a matter of fact, David, we were talking a little bit before the, the event. Why don't you open up your microphone without revealing your, your, um, 
what, what your exercise is. What do you like about it? I enjoy the freedom it gives me. Okay, good. Good. It gives you a lot of freedom, doesn't it? I can, I can only imagine. So what, um, is there any, any place you would like to go to do that hobby? Uh, uh, normally the trail. Okay. All right. Sounds good. That, that's a good place to go. So that, that's where I would go. Now, um, thank you, David. We're not, we're not going to belabor this too long. I, I would really like to. But did any of you feel left out of our little discussion? Obviously, we could have discussed this a lot more. But how many, let's, let's with the chat function, not privately, but to everybody, um, go ahead and, and say to everybody what you think his, his uh, hobby is. And let's see if anybody gets it. Oh, okay. Anybody else have guesses? Okay, anybody else? Okay, you guys are you guys are pretty much on top of it. You guys are pretty good. It was it's cycling was what what he had sent me, and two or three of you had said that it could have been hiking, it could have been it could have been mountain climbing, it could have been a few other things. But but the bottom line is, had we had we really discussed this, you probably would have figured it out pretty soon. But you have to stop and figure it out. It takes time. You can't just carry on and do what you're assigned to do because you don't know what it is that you're supposed to be doing. So you get left out of the conversation. This is especially critical, I think, during the environment that we're in today where everybody is working from home. Um, but actually, it can be, it can be rough when, when everybody's in the office. Um, do you ever feel like that in your job where maybe you're gone for a couple of days or all of a sudden you come in and you find out that, that two or three people have had a side conversation and you've been completely left out. Um, again, with working at home in the past few weeks, did that intensify that at all? The feeling of not knowing what's going on, of not knowing where the project is going? My strong belief is as a project leader, you must ask this question. Jennifer wrote, you, you have to be intentional. And I, I would agree with that. Communication requires that everyone knows. So ask WEN2K, who else needs to know? WEN2K, who else needs to know? So as you're dealing in conversations, as you're doing a sidebar, take a second and go, let's see, is there anybody else that needs to know that this decision has been made or going to go in this direction? Does anybody else need to know that this task is not done yet? Does anybody else need to know that this task needs to be done? So who else needs to know? I've even been in an environment where this sign was posted throughout in all the little places where people would gather. Um, maybe this pops up in, in some of your online, maybe that's your background slide, WEN2K. Who else needs to know? So if there's anybody that's not part of the meeting that day, they're on vacation, whatever the case might be, somebody takes charge and makes sure that everybody knows what needs to be done. Otherwise, we get a situation like George Bernard Shaw that communication hasn't actually taken place. So communication is also a two-way street, a very much a two-way street. So who should you listen to? So not only who should you tell, but who should you listen to? And that's kind of as we talk about getting a grip on project leadership, and I don't know that this is new to anyone, hopefully the reminder is, is helpful. Who should you listen to when doing a project? I'm, I'm gonna tell you just a couple of, of short stories and, and be thinking as I tell these, if you have seen either situations like these, or if you have a, a situation that you don't mind sharing with everybody, I, I'd love to hear it. So in a, in a class I was teaching, a, Sarah, a student shared this story about a bank that she worked at. There were two different branches of the same bank, branch A or branch one, whatever, had attempted to roll out this new software product with the tellers, with everybody that was working there. Their theory of getting things done, of managing projects was, you, you really need to uh, just do it. Management is gonna come up with what we're gonna do, we're gonna roll it out, we're just gonna get it done. And the tellers, the people that are actually doing the work, people that are in data entry, we're not gonna include them. 
we're just going to say, here's the package. It'll go quicker and much more efficiently. That way was what they determined. The student happened to be part of Bank, bank Branch 2. This is a true story. She was part of Bank, uh, bank Branch 2. And management brought in representatives to speak into the project. They brought in tellers. They brought in data entry people. They brought in the different people to make up the project team to make sure that the project, that everybody had a voice in it to some extent. Workers were asked to help literally guide the rollout of the software. Any ideas on which bank rolled out the new software first? Go ahead and type it in the chat or, or out loud, whatever you think. What, who do you think got it done first? Bank branch one or two? Okay, two, two, branch two, two, yep, exactly. Branch two got it done first, simply because they took the time. Uh, again, if you've heard this theme, if, uh, if you've been in these classes, you, you are these, these sessions, you've heard this theme that I've said is that you front load in your planning of the project, you front load a lot of the work so that when you actually do the, the project, it's much smoother. And part of that front loading is bringing in representatives to speak into the project, bringing in representatives to help guide the rollout. They're the ones that can often spot the problems early on. They're the ones that can see what needs to happen um, because they're living in it. They're doing it day by day. Now, some of their um, concerns may be unfounded, but you can work through that then knowing that there could be an issue rather than waiting until the project is almost ready to roll out and it gets derailed because people refuse to do it or don't want to be a part of it because they haven't had a voice. So um, one, one other story, and again, be thinking if, if you guys have something you could bring in here. In one class, another class, the student shared how she was a, a troublemaker. That was her label. And she really thought that she was as she came into the class. She really was kind of down on herself because she was the one that was creating problems for everybody. She said at least two or three times she was brought in at the end of the project to speak into it and make sure her department needs were met. In all cases, she really shook things up. And sometimes they literally had to start big chunks of the project over. So the question is, was she really the troublemaker? And as we talked, it became clear that no, she was not the troublemaker. The problem lies in the fact that she was brought in at the end of the project to speak into it. She came in at the last part. She should have been invited in again, front loading the project up at the very beginning. So as you think about this, who should you listen to, as you're planning your project, take the time and go, who else needs to be a part of this at the beginning so we don't get to the end of it and, and it blows up and things happen. Um, I, I hope that rings true for you guys. I hope, does anybody, does anybody have something that they, can, that they can add to that piece of the conversation? I would love to hear from you. Everywhere I go, when I tell stories like this, it, it does seem to resonate. Does it at least resonate with, with you? Does it make sense? Yeah, this is Crystal again. Yep, Crystal. Yeah, when we do our big projects, we always have a rollout meeting. Mm -hmm. with, and it's everybody that's going to be involved from concept to production. Mm -hmm. So then they, you know, production knows what's coming, but the team knows what they have to do to get it to production. When do you do your rollout meeting? Uh, usually about three to four weeks before we know we're gonna get anything for the project. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And then, we, then when the project's done, then we have another meeting to discuss what we could have done better. Okay, good, good. And there's actually with, with your hindsight meeting, whatever you wanna call it, some call it, um, well, there's all kinds of different names for, for the meeting after the project, but in the meeting after the project, those, those have been proven that when you do those, your projects have a better success rate. And hopefully you do a little celebration, it sounds like you do as a part of, a part of that as well. But it's, it's really important. Anybody else, real quick, before, I, before we're just about done with the session here. All right. So it's very important, and, and I always also say, listen to the still small voice to the people that don't say much you always have somebody that says a lot you always have somebody that says very little i always suggest if that person is not saying anything 
there's somebody you might want to go talk to and try to draw it out of them on their own. Um, sometimes the, the people that are the quietest have the greatest insight that can make the, uh, just a world of difference in your project towards project success. Another thing we want to look at, we're just a, we've got just a couple more things to do. For projects to be successful, it's imperative that you know who your stakeholders are and that you involve them early on. That just goes right into this, this story about the, the student that, that she always got brought in at the end. Bring them in at the beginning. Know who your stakeholders are. A stakeholder is an individual, group, or organization who may affect, be affected by, or perceive itself to be affected by a decision, activity, or outcome of the project. Highlight or perceive itself. Even people that just think they're a part of the project even though they may not be, or they think they may be impacted, though they may not be, they can still derail a project. It's still worth your time as a project leader to talk to them, to get to figure out who even thinks that they might be involved in this. Maybe you send out a survey, maybe you do whatever, just do whatever you need to do to find out who your stakeholders are, even if it's only those that think they're part of it. So if you're in an earlier getting a grip session that we've done, you would have seen an impact ease of effort matrix. Um, simply put, you look at how much impact a project will have, and you look at how easy the project is, and then you plot it on the matrix. There's a similar matrix for determining stakeholders. So you look at power and influence. You have a list of all the names that you can come up with. What is their power and influence? What is their interest level? If they have a lot of power and influence, and they have a high interest level, they're going to rate up in here. You're going to have to pay special attention to them. They really don't have much power or influence, or you don't think they do, and their interest level is low. You're not going to have to, I'd still say pay attention to them, but you can scale that back. So that's another matrix you can do to, to help figure out who the stakeholders are to make sure you've included everybody, including the, the troublemaker that. Um, is only a troublemaker because they should have been involved at the very beginning of the project. So who else needs to know? Who should you listen to? How should you treat all stakeholders, even if they only perceive themselves to be impacted by a project? Those are some key questions that I hope you go home with or, or stay home with in, in, as, as it might be. And I love this quote too, you can easily judge the character of a man by how he treats those who can do nothing for him. Obviously that goes for both genders, this is an older quote. You can easily judge the character of a person by how they treat those who can do nothing for them. So even if they just perceive themselves, they still deserve to be treated well. And I think that's a quote that we can, we can live with. Now I mentioned Hila Packard earlier in my, and we're just right at the last minute here. Um, the, the quote that, that, that I have from them is we approach each situation with the belief that people want to do a good job and will do so given the proper tools and support. Another great quote. So a couple of resources that I'd like to leave you with. Go to YouTube and search for HP Origins video and look for Voyage of the Endurance video, which is Shackleton's story on YouTube. Uh, these two are just phenomenal leadership tools that I think will do you a lot of good. Um, again, this is, this is older stuff, but there's a lot of good stuff that can be gleaned from it. Um, there, there's still a lot of good in, in the old that we can take that, that still applies today. Appreciate your time today. Um, it, it, it looks like it's the top of the hour. Dana, do you have any, any final words or does anybody have any last questions before we depart? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. And uh, yeah. I think we'll leave Thanks. it at this Oh, you let me, let, before you all get, let me, I forgot one thing. We have one more session in this series. We and do. Getting a, uh, getting a grip on uh, tools, I believe it is, project tools. I need two or three, if you're going to be at that, I need two or three sample projects, real life projects that people are using. Um, so if you could get those to me, um, if you want to be part of that next session, uh, we'll actually use some tools to look at your projects. So Dana, go ahead and we'll be done. 
Yep, that's pretty much what I was going to say as well. Just want to thank everybody for joining us today. June 29th, as Stephen mentioned, is the, the last webinar in this series, Getting a Grip on Project Breakdown Tools. And if you do have a project, send it to Steve. You can also send it to myself. And I'll probably send out a reminder as well a couple of days before that session to those who have registered um, to see if they would like to submit a project for us to um, talk about during the session. Other than that, we won't keep you. Thanks again. And you guys have a fantastic weekend. Did you see Crystal's note there, Dana, about sending information for the next session? Yes. Okay. Yep. Can Thank do. You. All right. Thank you so much. Have a great, great day and a great weekend. Bye-bye.